Good afternoon, everyone. Uh, I'm up next. Uh, my name is Samantha Tross, and I'm a consultant orthopedic surgeon. I'm at Ealing Hospital, and I also am a scion, and also I operate at the Clementine Churchill Hospital. My aim today is to talk to you about adult hip pain, and I uh, will help, uh, will discuss the, the topic by using some case-based discussions. And I know later on we've got the round table sessions. So I, obviously because of the time limit, I can't cover everything, uh, but I'm more than happy to ask any questions later on. So as I said, I'm at Ealing Hospital. I, I, a little bit about me, a little bit of my background. Uh, I trained at University College and Middlesex School of Medicine. I did my basic surgical training at the Royal London and Whitechapel and higher surgical training at Geyser St. Thomas's. I then went overseas to Canada and Australia for fellowship training in hip and knee replacement surgery, primary revision, and I've subsequently trained in hip arthroscopy. So what are the causes of hip pain? Uh, they are numerous. When a patient comes complaining of hip pain, the pain may indeed be emanating from the hip, but it may be coming from structures around the hip, uh, those directly adjacent or far away from the lumbar spine or even intra-abdominal pathology. So um, don't necessarily think that pain around the hip is from the hip itself. And in order for you to make the differential diagnosis, it's, uh, look at the common things are common. So according to age, the younger patients are more likely to have muscle sprains. Uh, they may have uh, bursitis, stress fractures. In an older patient, osteoarthritis has got to be the highest differential of, of hip pain. There are pathological causes such as myeloma. And they, of course, can have muscle tears and sprains also. From uh, the hip itself, the structures that can cause uh, pain can actually be all layers. So it can actually be the articular cartilage, it can be the muscles surrounding the hip, it can be from the inner structures such as the labrum, which is a fibro cartilage structure of the hip, which I'll talk about in more detail shortly. Um, and of course, there are nerves that traverse the hip. The most common nerve to be in, involved uh, in hip pain is a sciatic nerve because that actually passes through muscles very adjacent to the hip capsule. And uh, it can either be uh, involved from muscle hypertrophy, so in patients who are weightlifters, or from uh, injury at surgery. And I'll show you the, uh, the location of it. So just to quickly recap on the anatomy, um, you've got the femoral, uh, it's, it's a ball and socket joint. You've got the femoral head, which should be spherical. And there should be a gradient between the femoral head and the neck. The neck is much narrower, allowing free range of motion of the hip without it impinging up on the acetabulum. Uh, you've got the articular cartridge which surrounds the femoral head and the acetabular, uh, the acetabulum. And at the outer edge of the acetabulum is a fibro cartridge structure known as the labrum. This is a very important structure. We're now really realizing the importance of it because it actually protects the articular cartilage. And damage to the labrum can make the articular cartilage more susceptible to injury and therefore can lead to early arthritis. The greater trochanter where the abductors uh, of the hip uh, attach and they help keep the pelvis stable during motion and the lesser trochanter where the uh, iliosoas, uh, the hip flexors attach. Wherever you have a tendons coming onto bone, between that and the bony surface is a fluid filled sac known as the bursa which reduces the shear force and that those bursi can be inflamed. And they can, uh, bursi are located at bony promises all over the body. But around the hip, uh, they're particularly around the uh, greater trochanter and the lesser trochanter. And the, uh, at the greater trochanter, you've got the gluteus maximus, the medius, and the minimus. And in between each of those tendons is a bursi. There is not a single bursi, there are several bursi. And that's important to know because when it comes to you giving uh, injections to the bursa, uh, it may mean that you, if the patient hasn't responded, that you haven't got into the right one. So here is the uh, acetabulum. Um, the articular cartilage covers most of the surface apart from the very inferior aspect where you've got the transverse ligament and then you've got the ligamentum teres that comes up here to supply uh, blood to the head when you're younger. When you get older, most of the blood supply comes via the capsule. And then the labrum is around the periphery. And what that does, it enables, it deepens the socket, making it more stable. And it also helps in lubrication and shear of joint forces across the joint. Uh, 
Uh, quickly recap on the muscles. You've got the, uh, the hip flexors at the front, the adductor muscles medially, the abductors laterally. And tears in any of these muscles can give rise to hip pain. Um, you may have heard of something called um, Gilmore's groin or a sports hernia. And that's where you have the abdominal musculature. There's normally an opening, an inguinal ring, where in men the spermatic cord comes through. Uh, and in that hiatus, where, the, where there's a natural opening, there can be tears. And that's what, what's known as a sports hernia. It's not actually a hernia as you know it, where there's bowel or something moving out. It's just a tear within the abdominal wall. And that also can give pain within the hip region. Around the back of the hip, uh, Everyone see? I'm pointing on this side, but uh, it's difficult to try and get all sides of the room. I hope you can all see over here. I'm so sorry about that. Um, th this here is near. But you've got the abductor muscles, uh, the short external rotators, I beg your pardon, and the posterior aspect of the hip. They're deep to the gluteus maximus, which is the muscle in the buttock. And coming through those muscles, you have the sciatic nerve. That's the normal, uh, sorry the normal position of it, but it can sometimes come above or below, but usually it comes just below that piriformis muscle. And if there's, uh, as I said, hypertrophy of that muscle uh, in, in weightlifters or bodybuilders, then that can lead to impingement of the nerve and they can get sciatic-like symptoms. So uh, when a patient complains of sciatica, doesn't necessarily mean it's coming from the lumbar spine. It could be because the nerve is trapped uh, between the muscle. Around the front, there are nerves as well. You've got the lateral cutaneous nerve of the thigh, which comes just beneath the inguinal ligament. Um, and that can uh, get impinged, um, either again because of the muscle beneath it being hypertrophied, or we're we seeing it more commonly now, and a lot of, uh, it's, it's now very common to wear your, your trousers right on the hip. And if, if, if you have a, a, your, your belt or trousers rubbing on that area, then it, th this nerve can be entrapped. And if that occurs, the patients tend to present with numbness or tingling on the anterior lateral aspect of the thigh. Also, we've seen it with patients who um, have stopped suddenly and the seat belt is tightened. And that's just where the seat belt's coming across. So they may present with pain on the anterior lateral aspect of the thigh. So that's when that nerve is commonly injured. The femoral nerve is not that, that, that commonly injured because there's a lot of protection between that and the hip joint. Um, though when you are putting retractors in to expose the hip, it's at, it's at risk then. So how do you make a diagnosis of hip pain? Well, you've got to take a clear history. You want to know where is the pain located. Pain coming from the hip joint quite commonly presents with uh, symptoms in the groin or the lateral aspect of the thigh. It's very rare for you to get pain in the buttock, though it can occur. If someone's complaining of pain in the buttock, think more of the lumbar spine, um, and you can get bursa, uh, bursitis there um, from the, the, ish, the muscles attaching to the ischial spine, so the short external rotators. But commonly, uh, as I said, for hip pain, it's normally the groin or lateral aspect of the thigh. So where is the pain? What's the nature of it? Um, neurological pain tends to, to, to give a, a burning uh, type uh, symptom, whereas uh, pain from the hip can either be dull but occasionally sharp. So the, the, the type of the pain. Um, and is there anything else associated with it? Is it any sort of catching or locking which may help uh, uh, hone the diagnosis? So if you've got tears within the actual um, labrum of the, of, the, of the hip, then they may get a catching feeling, a feeling of instability of the hip. So you want to just investigate a bit more about, about the nature of the pain. Um, and in, in patients who present with pain of a short uh, duration, I think it's appropriate to give them a trial of physiotherapy, um, particularly in young patients, and if, if on examination there isn't any significant restriction of motion. Um, with the examination, oh, this is, okay, this is a quick summary of the hip pain. I'm just saying that pain anteriorly uh, is commonly uh, arthritis, labral tears, the bursi, muscle tears, uh, and don't forget the, the, the osteitis, the pubis, around the pubis, uh, that can also cause pain around the front. Laterally, um, arthritis, but uh, trochanteric bursitis as well. And around the back, think primarily of lumbar pathology. On examination, you're going to look, look for any muscle wasting, particularly around the buttock region. Um, look for uh, any, uh, any limp, any, any leg length discrepancy. You can't really feel the hip joint. 
So I think if, if you're feeling around the hip and it's tender, it's not likely to be coming from the joint itself. It's around the structures around the hip. Uh, and commonly when I do a hip examination, I feel around the greater trochanter, that is a very common uh, place for tenderness. Um, and I, I do feel around the pubic symphysis as well. Uh, but apart from that, and I, I always examine the lumbar spine, so you would, you would examine that as well. Uh, but there is, you cannot feel the hip joint. So tenderness around the hip means it's not intra-articular pathology. Uh, movement, the first movement that you normally lose uh, with uh, hip pathology is internal rotation. So you look for that specifically, because often you can have hip, hip pathology and the rest of the movements are there. But it's the internal rotation that you need to, to focus on. Special tests around the hip, well, the, the structures around the hip that can, can be involved are the iliotibial band, which is a fascial-like structure, which surrounds the, it's just deep to the skin, you've got the fascia, and it's thickened on the lateral aspect, and that's called the iliotibial band. And that helps keep the knee in extension, that can often be inflamed. It uh, originates around the pelvis and inserts uh, around the knee. So iliotibial band syndrome can, can give pain around the hip, but also distally around the knee. And there are tests to look for tightness of the iliotibial band. You would lie the patient on the side, and you would try to extend the, the leg backwards. And if it's tight, then they would, they would start to flex the knee. Uh, the most, uh, I, I would say that the, the more important test, however, is a test for impingement. Because the labrum is such an important structure and these are tests for labral tears. And particularly in young patients, if you have a labral tear, we need to pick up the labral tears early. So that's the test I really want to home in on today. The, the, the routine test for the hip is looking for muscle wasting, um, for weakness of the abductors, because someone who has hip pathology often gets muscle weakness. Is everyone clear how to do the Trendelenburg test? Okay, well, I, okay. How I do the Trendelenburg test is I get the patient to stand in front of me, and the hip that I'm testing is the one that I get them to put the weight on. I lift the opposite hip. Uh, let me come here. I get them to stand, and I lift. The, the, the tested hip is the one that they're standing on. They lift the opposite hip. When you are standing on one leg, what's keeping you up is that these muscles are contracting to keep the pelvis level. If the muscles are weak, the pelvis will tilt. So if you are testing the patient, you're facing opposite the patient, and they're standing, let's say you're testing the right leg, if they tilt, they will fall to the left and put pressure on your right hand. So the, the, the positive sign will be on the, the side exactly that you're testing. If you're testing the right hip, you will feel it in your right hand. If you're testing the left hip, you'll see you feel it in the left hand. Is everyone clear on that? So you're opposite the patient, the patient's resting their hands on yours, and they're going up onto one leg. And if they tilt, They'll go like that and put pressure on your right hand. The only confounding thing for that is you've got to make sure that they're not trying to cheat by holding their shoulders over to one side. So that's a very quick test. And then after that, uh, I just check the range of motion, flexion, extension, abduction, external and internal rotation. As I said, you home in on the internal rotation. And then the next test that I, I personally think is very important are the impingement tests. And I've got some diagrams just to show you. So with the anterior impingement test, and the, of the, the labral tears, the more common area to be torn is the anterior aspect. You can get tears posteriorly, but most commonly the anterior aspect. And what you do is you have the patient supine, you have the hip and knee flexed to 90 degrees, and then what you want to do is internally rotate the hip and adduct it. So you internally rotate and then bring it across to the midline. And they should feel pain. You may even get a, a sensation of a clicking uh, if there's displacement of the labrum. Is everyone clear on the anterior impingement test? It, and you can do it fairly quickly. Now with the, the posterior impingement test, either you get the patient to turn over, but I think it's quicker to just slide them down to the edge of the couch because they're already supine. But you've got to slide them down sufficiently so that you can extend the hip. Okay, you need to be able to extend the hip for the posterior impingement test. So you extend the hip, you externally rotate the leg, and then you adduct. And the same thing, they should feel pain in the posterior aspect of the hip, and there may be associated click. But um, a lot of patients have labral tears and don't have any positive signs. So please, if you, if, if you have a patient, particularly a, a young patient who has pain in the hip, who is not responding to a short course of physiotherapy, physiotherapy and by that I mean about six weeks, um, if they haven't responded, do refer them on. Because often the signs can be subtle. And it's so important with label tears that we pick them up early. 
uh, because if, if, if they're not picked up early, <coughs> we'll not be able to repair them and we'll have to end up excising it. And of course, that can have uh, implications for the articular cartilage. So for young people, please be aware and consider labral tears and refer early. What are the investigations I would recommend? Well, the, the most common and useful uh, investigation is the x-ray, because there's a lot of things that you can see on, on x-ray. Um, you cannot, in young patients, obviously, if they've got muscle tears and so on, and, and you'll get that from the history as to whether that's most likely, then I'm not saying that you should have an x-ray. But if the history is not clear, x-ray is a very useful uh, investigation. You cannot see the labrum on x-ray, but there are certain features on x-ray that show patients who are predisposed to labral tears, okay? So if someone has a, a deep socket, um, then you would see that on x-ray, and they're more likely to have labral tears. If they have a very shallow acetabulum, one that doesn't really cover the head, so they tend to have larger labrum, they are more prone. I know it's difficult for you because you don't actually get the x-rays, uh, you don't get to see the films, you get the report. And so what I ask of you is, in a young patient, if you write as much information on the, uh, the x-ray request form and say whether you suspect there's a label tear, then they can do the relevant x-ray. Because often, with labral tears, there are uh, abnormalities on the hip which occur around the front surface of the femoral head. With a standard x-ray, you might miss it. So unless you put that information on the x-ray form, the relevant x-ray may not be taken. So that, that's the only thing I'd like to highlight to you. But there's a lot of information we can get from the x-ray. Obviously, in arthritis and so on, then, then it, it, it's very, very useful. Blood tests only really come into play when I'm trying to look for an underlying rheumatological condition uh, and, uh, or exclude an infection. Um, that's when I would uh, generally tend to do blood tests apart from working them up for theater. Ultrasound is very useful for diagnosis of bursitis or muscle tears. Um, that's, that's when I, I would use the ultrasound. And of course, ultrasound guided injections around the trochanteric region. Um, when often by the time patients have come to me, they've had a trial in, in, in primary care of an injection. So I wouldn't normally repeat the injection. I would then do an ultrasound guided injection because we know that they're, they're superficial and deep bursae and there's a chance that you might miss the, the, the appropriate bursae. And also because pains around the trochanteric region does not necessarily mean it's bursitis. There are other causes such as uh, muscle tears um, w which can cause pain in the very same location. So the ultrasound will help differentiate that. MRI um, is very useful for uh, things like uh, stress fractures. So I've had quite a few patients recently who've presented with fractures. So they've got pain which um, is unexplained and the x-ray hasn't shown much information and so you can you could do an MRI and it's a very useful diagnosis. Also for vascular necrosis in the very early stages, um, you would see signs in the MRI that you wouldn't see on x-ray. Um, and for, for the labrum, uh, the MRI really comes into, into, into force. It is much more sensitive if it's done with an arthrogram. And the arthrogram is where you inject dye uh, into the, um, uh, the acetabulum, into the joint itself, and that will then um, filter in into the crevices of, of the tear of the labrum. There, there are investigations carrying out now to look at doing peripheral in, in, uh, infiltration of, of the contrast, uh, rather than the injecting directly into the hip to reduce the risk of infection. And uh, the, the early results show that that's, uh, it's probably as effective as in injecting directly into the joint. So contrast plus MRI is very useful. The bone scan, again, usually for, um, I use that mainly for uh, investigation of uh, painful prostheses, if someone has pain. To, but, the, but in the first two years after a, a joint has been implanted, uh, the, the, the bone scan may give a false positive. So the first couple of years after someone's had a hip replacement is a very uh, difficult time. Uh, and if you suspect infection, then a white skull scan is probably better. But a, a bone uh, in, in the first couple of years is very difficult to, to investigate pain in someone with a prosthesis. And hip arthroscopy is moving away. Not only is it therapeutic, but also um, in some cases it's, it's um, diagnostic, uh, where we have um, uh, investigated the patient, they have persistent pain, we're unclear of the underlying cause, and we, uh, in those cases what I would do first is a diagnostic injection. So I do an injection of local anesthetic into the hip, and if the pain goes with that, then that locates it to the joint, and then I may then do a, a diagnostic hip arthroscopy just to see what's, what's going on. So that was just a, just a quick overview, and so just to see how much uh, you've taken in, I've just done a couple of uh, case studies.
So this is a case of a patient I saw. It's a 44-year-old lady. She's a keen sportswoman. She had a sudden onset of groin pain. Uh, she was complaining of intermittent knee pain. She had no pain at rest, only in activity, particularly on twisting movements. Uh, there was an associated clicking and feeling of instability. Um, on clinical examination, there wasn't much to see, just mild internal rotation, loss of internal rotation. Any views from the floor? What, what are the differential diagnoses here? If you had a patient like this come to your clinic? Tendon. Huh? Tendon, okay, tendon injury. Label tear, yeah? Yes, okay. Okay, okay. Right. So, I mean, all of those, I mean, she, she's young. Um, so, um, although you wouldn't necessarily think of arthritis right away, I have to say that the, it's, it's really merging the pathologies, and I'm seeing younger and younger patients with arthritis, okay? Um, so, it, it, yes, arthritis could be there. Uh, label tear, one has to think about. She's got sudden onset of pain, and she's a sports person. You've got to think about a stress fracture, okay? You've got to think about that. Um, and she could also have a muscle tear because she's a sports person. So all of those things are in there. She could have bursitis. And so you can see how it's not always clear cut. Uh, and then you have to then really start dissecting the history. But this thing, the, the clicking and the feeling of instability, that you would really get with arthritis or is something mechanical within the hip or a labral tear. In fact, this woman had a labral tear. So is that instability? The pain by itself, you've got all the list of differential diagnoses, but when they have that feeling of instability, you've got to think about something mechanical. And it's either going to be a loose body or something within the hip joint or a tear of the labrum. Okay? But you can see how you have to work through and try and exclude those differential diagnoses. So I'm just going to give you a little quick overview of labral tears. Labral tears can be caused either by femoral acetabular impingement, which I'm going to uh, uh, show you what that is exactly. There are two types, pin and cam, uh, uh, cam and pincer. It can be caused by trauma, a, a single traumatic ev event, or by repetitive stress to the joint, particularly in patients who have lax capsules. Uh, the normal head of, I'm going to turn this side because I feel I'm neglecting this side of the room. <laughs> You've got the, the femoral head, which should be spherical. There's a gradient between the head and the neck. And the acetabulum, though giving good coverage to the head, does not completely en enclose it. Okay? And in that way, you get a good uh, range of motion, freedom of movement. With the CAM type of, uh, of lesion, what happens is patients have excess bone on the head-neck junction. And because of that, they haven't got as much clearance of the femur before it comes into contact with the acetabulum. And remember, at the edge of the acetabulum is a labrum, OK? So if this is moving up there, it's going to impact against the labrum. And re repeated uh, such episodes will lead to a tear. With a pincer type, the, the problem is, uh, is on the acetabulum. So they've got excess bony coverage, OK? Um, now that can be either because someone has a deep socket or, or protrusio, where the socket is very, very medial and are almost entering into the pelvis. And conditions that predispose you to that, it can either be uh, a familial condition, uh, you, you get it in, in, in patients with rheumatoid arthritis, SLE, um, the glycogen storage diseases, Paget's disease, all of those can lead to a very deep socket. And often it's a, it's a very mixed picture. Uh, the, the history, as I said to you before, it's normally pain, because it's coming from the hip, it's either normally pain in the groin or the lateral aspect of the hip. Though, if the labrum is torn posteriorly, you may present with posterior hip pain. Normally, it's pain that comes on on activity. You not usually have a rest pain, and usually with a sudden twisting movements, or when you have the knee, the, 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 the knee highly flexed, such that um, the, the neck area is coming into contact with the labrum, particularly in the cam type of lesion. Um, uh, and there may be associated feeling of instability and clicking. But, you know, th th those things may not be present. Obviously, if all of those are present, then it makes the diagnosis very, very easy. On examination, there may be very little to find. Please remember that. So in young people, even though there's not much to find, please refer them on if the pain is persisting. Do do the positive. Do look for the impingement uh, signs. The investigation for a label, we start off with the x-ray. As I said to you, there's certain things that you can see on the x-ray. Um, I'm just going straight through to this one here. This is an x-ray. Oops. This one is trying to show you the coverage of the femoral head. 
and this has got satisfactory coverage here. If there's excess coverage, then we would think about um, um, a pincer type of lesion. The reason I said to you you need to put the, the, the right information on the radiograph request form is that there are special x-rays. Um, this is a cross-table axial view that one would do to really pick up that cam lesion, the excess bone in the head neck junction. It normally occurs more commonly on the front of the femur. And with a standard AP x-ray, you might miss it. Um, so this is just a cross-table axial view. I'm not going to spend too much time on that. Here, I've, I've, I've got one with an obvious bump here in the head neck junction just to show you. But as you don't get x-rays, I'm not going to spend too much time on this. Um, the, the normal acetabulum should be, this line here is called the ilioischial line. And the socket normally lies lateral to this, okay? In a normal, I say normal because there is a variation, there's a normal distribution. But in most cases, uh, the, the socket lies lateral to this line. When you get it coming beyond this line, we call that coxa profunda. And when it goes beyond the line very medially, which is the iliopectineal line, we call that protrusio. So for everyone there on this side, I don't know if you can see, this line here is the ilioischia line where the black arrow is, and the hip socket normally lies to this side of that. Okay? So anyone who has the, the acetabulum going medial to this line, they're at risk of the pincer type of lesion. The head is very enclosed, and therefore, it doesn't have as much freedom of movement before this impingement. Um, this is a radiograph. It doesn't show up very well. It's showing the crossover sign. The normal acetabulum points forward about uh, uh, between 10 to 20 degrees. It's not directly to the side. It's antiverted. And because it's antiverted, when you take an x-ray, the anterior wall lies medially to the posterior wall. They don't cross each other. If there's a crossover, and this x-ray is actually showing a crossover sign, that suggests there's excess bone um, around the front of the hip, which could mean that the, the patient is at risk for a pincer lesion. Um, and again, the, the x-ray beam has to be at a certain height above the patient in order to get this type of view. And that's why you need to give the relevant information on the request form. Labral tears, um, they don't tend to do very well conservatively. The reason I put conservative in there is that when the first patient first presents to you, you don't know what the pain is. It could be muscular and so on, so you give that time for, for things to settle. But if uh, after a period of conservative treatment, things don't work, then you need to think about uh, intervention. Uh, I'm just going to whiz past the, the physiotherapy. What can we do surgery, surgically? Um, gold standard of, of, of um, treatment of labral tears is now arthroscopic. In the past, it was open surgery. But as these are often very, very young patients, if you open and have to dislocate the hip, there's a significant risk of avascular necrosis. Um, obviously, in those who are very expert at doing that, the risks are minimal. But um, it's much more technically involved. And these days, uh, there isn't very much uh, that can be done arthroscopically that can be done openly, that can't be done arthroscopically. The only advantage, and I think that the only s s indication for open surgery is if you're trying to realign the pelvis, okay? So if someone's uh, got an acetabulum, which is pointing to completely in the wrong direction, you can actually cut all the bones of the pelvis and realign it. And that's really the only um, uh, area where, where, where open surgery is required. For most other things, arthroscopic uh, surgery w will treat most conditions around the hip. Openly, what would you do? You dislocate the hip. This is what we did in the past. We would uh, have certain guides to, to tell us where the normal acetabulum ends. Here, this patient has excess bone on uh, cartilage on the neck junction and bone. On this side, there's excess bone and cartilage. Um, so once you've delineated where the normal acetabulum lies, then you just gently resect off the cartilage until you recreate the normal anatomy. But you can understand how this is, this is high risk, and there's, there's a risk of um, damaging the blood supply. Um, so here we've got a 68-year-old, knee pain, pain at, at rest and at night, reduced walking distance, um, associated history of back pain, complains of occasional pins and needles in his feet. This is the kind of patient that you might see. What are your thoughts? Spine problem. Okay, I'm hearing spine problem. Sciatica, I'm hearing. Yep. Stenosis, yes. Anything else? Arthritis, yes. Well, this chap actually had more than one thing. And look, it's, it's confusing because he's, he's got pain in the knee, he's got back pain, and so on. In fact, this patient turned out to have 
hip arthritis as well as lumbar spine arthritis. Had no problems around the knee. Had a combination of both things. And this is where, you know, often with these elderly patients, it's not a single diagnosis. And then our job is to try and decide which is the one that they're most symptomatic from, okay? Remember, there are patients that have arthritis in the hip who may not have any hip pain at all. They may be coming uh, with, with, with knee pain. I've had a few patients who've been very shocked. They've come complaining of knee pain. I tell them it's the hip. They're, they're in disbelief. So whenever someone comes, always remember to examine the joint above. So if someone has knee pain, always examine the hip. And with hip pain, always examine the spine. Okay? Um, so this patient had a combination of both. Uh, but. Uh, uh, after we had a chat and so on, uh, we realized that the, the problem that they were most symptomatic from was actually the hip. But in, in someone like this, I would counsel and say that I cannot make you completely pain-free, because if there's associated lumbar pathology, there will still be some pain, but we can make a significant impact into the symptoms. So here we are, someone's got severe osteoarthritis. When it comes to this stage, if the patient's medically fit, um, then the only uh, option here is a hip replacement. And here it comes into, well, what, what do we need the, uh, determine as medically fit? Well, um, I think that, you know, it, it's, if a patient is in significant pain, then you should put them forward and refer them in and let them be assessed. Um, because there are some patients who have been advised by the GP, uh, they've, they've come to see me privately, they've been advised not to, to, to have surgery because they weren't fit enough. Um, and, and yes, they may have been higher risk, but that's not to say that they weren't a candidate for hip replacement surgery. There are some that we can't offer surgery, but I think that if someone's in pain, irrespective of the medical condition, we should at least refer them up and let them get assessed. So um, the reason I wanted to touch on arthritis for you today is there, there's been a lot of stuff in the literature, particularly about metal on metal hip replacements. Are you all a favor with that? Yeah, so generally the, the, the the first type of hip replacement that was described by Sir John Charney was a metal head and a polyethylene liner, but there were problems with that because the polyethylene liner often broke down and led to loosening of the hip, and so different bearing surfaces had to be investigated. Um, uh, at the same time, re when we had the, 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 the hip replacement by Sir John Charney, they were looking at metal and metal bearings, uh, and there were a lot of problems with that. <laughs> but when someone went and reinvestigated that, we realized that the reason why they had problems is there was a mismatch between the surfaces. And we found that if the two surfaces are machined together and form well, they, they can actually function very well. Um, and that, that's from, from that the Birmingham hip resurfacing um, uh, came to the fore. Unfortunately, every other company then tried to get a similar because that was doing so well to bring out their own prosthesis, and they did not do as well. So quite a few have had to be withdrawn from the market. And the reason for that being is that if you have two surfaces that are not uh, conform to each other, then there's a lot of metal debris that's generated. And those metal ions have carcinogenic potential. Okay? And that's particularly why, and, and we know that those metal ions can cross the placenta, why we would not offer uh, metal on metal replacement to a woman of childbearing age. Okay? The hip resurfacing is still uh, a good prosthesis. Uh, they're not all the same as each other. I think the Birmingham really is the gold standard. All other types of uh, metal on metal hip resurfacings have been found to be inferior. And apart from the carcinogenic material uh, or potential, these metal ions can set up a very uh, intense inflammatory reaction. Uh, and that massive inflammation that occurs around the hip is known as a pseudotumor. I don't know if you've heard that term, pseudotumor. And these, 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 these tumors, which is a, in the, this means a new growth, but it can be so large, they compress on the structures around the hip. You've had, we've had patients where femoral veins have been compressed. Uh, they've had thrombosis or is pressing on, 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 the, on the nerve around the hip. But it often leads to a lot of pain and is associated with loosening of the prosthesis. So I just want to touch on that because that's something that's been in the news very recently. Um, so we've had to investigate different bearing surfaces. The, the best bearing surface is really um, ceramic on ceramic, yeah, the one to the very left here. But uh, that has its problems. Ceramic is a very brittle material, although it's very tough and the wear rates are very low, it's brittle and it can fracture uh, and, and it's very difficult to, to treat if it, if it does fracture. It can also, in very rare circumstances, lead to squeaking. And so I do warn my patients about that. Uh, it, it's rare, but it can occur. But it really is the toughest material, and in the young patients, it's something which we, we, I, I personally prefer to offer. And I'm just looking at the different wear rates there, and why, why, why is it that we look at uh, different types of implanting the prosthesis? Hip replacements can either be uncemented or cemented. 
in the younger patients, there's a move towards unsemented prostheses because when we've looked at data from registries of, of, of large amounts of patients and looked at the survival rates of prostheses, what we found is that in young patients who were given cemented prostheses, over time the cement fragmented and led to loosening of the prosthesis. And this fragmentation occurred more commonly on the acetabular side rather than the femoral side. And because of that, um, for me in my practice, uh, even though it's the, the, the rate of that loosening is less in all the patients, in everyone I go for an uncemented cup. On the femoral side, the, the, the cemented femur does very, very well in the older patient. Um, and uh, therefore, for patients, and my arbitrary cutoff is about 65, but of course, you know, it, it's, it's, it's not set in, set in stone. Um, uh, over that, I give a patient a, a cemented prosthesis. Why? Because the uncemented prosthesis, the way it gets fixation is it has to be wedged into the bone. And the older you get, uh, the, less, the bone is less strong and there's a risk of fracture. But when you are implanting it with cement, then you can gently uh, insert the prosthesis into the femur. So for an older patient, I go with a cemented stem. With a younger patient, I go uncemented. But they, I warn them there is a risk of fracture. With the uncemented prosthesis, it's coated with a bone mineral substance, which attracts the bone, and the bone bonds onto it. And once your bone bonds onto the prosthesis, it is held fast. So uh, in, in a young patient, uncemented, in an older patient, a hybrid, i.e. an uncemented cup with a cemented stem. And then the, 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 the bearing surfaces, I told you, they can vary. You can have metal and polyethylene. You can have um, um, metal, ceramic and polyethylene. You can have ceramic on, on, on ceramic. Okay? And if you're having a resurfacing, then of course that's metal on metal. So I think I've touched on the metal on metal debate, so I'm going to go straight past that. We've talked about pseudo tumors. Uh, my results, okay. So, uh, hip replacement is a very, very successful operation. Um, what you should say to your patients, it's very unlikely that you have a risk of dislocation unless the patient has some other predisposing cause. Um, obviously, you've got to place the prosthesis within the bony pelvis. Uh, and if they have deficiency of the acetabulum, then you are restricted in how you place it up. So, they may be more at risk of dislocation. But we can counteract that by going for larger hex head size. The larger the, 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 the head of the prosthesis, the more the range of motion before there's impingement, con uh, contact between the stem, neck, and, and the acetabulum. Um, nerve injuries are, 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 are very rare, but they can occur. I tend to use an anterior lateral approach, and therefore, there are no nerves directly in line of the incision, but they are at risk when you introduce the, the, the retractors around the acetabulum. Uh, but because it's because of, of a, a squashing of the nerve rather than a cutting, it tends to recover, but it can take some months. Okay. Right. Okay, this, I'm just going to quickly run through these now. This was um, a, a patient who has pain in the lateral aspect of the thigh and actually turned out to be trochanteric bursitis. But if you've got a, a patient of this uh, age, he's had a recent um, hip replacement, he's got pain in the lateral aspect of the thigh, you've got to think about trochanteric bursitis. As, as the most common thing, okay? Now, these days, we've moved away from saying trochanteric bursitis because everyone just sort of labels pain around the hip as trochanteric bursitis. And we know that there are many pathologies that uh, are in that area that can lead to pain in the lateral aspect of the hip. Bursitis, I've told you about, tears of the muscle, the iliotibial band, and snapping hip. You know, a lot of patients come and say to me, my hip's dislocating. I feel as though it's coming in and out of joint. And often, it's nothing to do with the hip itself. It's the structures overlying the hip. Either the iliotibial band, rubbing and flicking over a prominent greater trochanter, or the flexors at the front of the hip, they can actually be uh, rubbing ac across the lesser trochanter, or the anterior inferior iliac spine of the pelvis. And as the muscle subluxes over the front of that bony prominence, it can feel as though the hip's giving way, and you feel as though the hip's dislocating. But it's very, very rare to be dislocating your hip. It's not like the shoulder where you can have an unstable shoulder. The hip is not that type of joint. So whenever patients come and say, look, my hip's dislocating, it's actually structures around the hip. Um, so for the treatment of this, this condition, we've, I've, talked, I've touched on that there's, there's more than one bursa. Um, the causes are repetitive stress, weak muscles, trauma, disease of the spine, leg length inequalities. If someone has stroke and bursitis, please just check their leg lengths uh, because it can be easily remedied by giving them a, a little shoe insert. If they've got lumbar spine pathology, the, 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 the bursitis is likely to persist because they've got weak muscles. So that needs to be addressed. You've got to treat the underlying problem. Okay. Um, 
I think it is uh, useful to try, try a course of physiotherapy, and if physiotherapy doesn't work, uh, I, I think a, a, um, an injection can be trialed uh, in, in the primary care setting. But as I said to you, if it hasn't worked, don't keep repeatedly injecting the patient. You know, it could be that you've got the diagnosis wrong. Okay, um, I would normally, if a patient comes to me at that point, as I said, get ultrasound-guided uh, injection of the area after investigation. Um, and if that hasn't worked, then these days we mo we're moving more towards uh, treatment with shockwave therapy. Um, now, shockwave therapy, no one's actually very clear how it works, uh, but you're transmitting sound waves uh, across the, the inflamed area, and that is supposed to lead to an inflammatory response it leads to um, increased blood flow around the area. Um, and then um, with, with the blood flow uh, and new blood vessels that form, there's, there's increased healing of, of the area. It's, it was first used for treatment of things like plantar fasciitis and uh, lateral epicondylitis of the elbow. Um, but it's now actually being used more commonly for uh, the trochanteric region. So I think if, if you have a patient who's got recalcitrant uh, well, pain around the, the greater trochanter, then consider referring them up for, for a trial of shockwave therapy. But there's, there's not a, a huge lot in the, in, in the literature on it, but uh, I was, uh, there are a few studies out there showing that it's been beneficial. So it's worthwhile trying if nothing else has worked. It's very, very rare that someone would have to have surgery um, to excise an inflamed bursa. Uh, very, very rare that we'd have to do surgical treatment. Now, this is another interesting case because I've seen a, quite a few of these recently. Uh, this is a young lady. Uh, she was 28 weeks pregnant. She had a sudden onset of left groin pain. Um, and it was so severe that she was unable to put weight on her leg at all. Um, and when she was examined, there, there wasn't uh, well, pain in the extremes of motion, but nothing else. What do you think of someone who's pregnant who has hip pain? Have a <laughs> Yes, yes, all of those things. Um, but this lady had transient osteoporosis of pregnancy. Have you heard of that? Yeah. Yeah, so you've had a patient like that. Yeah. I, I've seen it quite commonly recently. I don't know, these things go in spurts. Um, but it's usually in the, in the last trimester of pregnancy, although I, the, it has, I have seen it in patients er, early on in the pregnancy, but it's usually in the later trimester. And the reason for it is very unclear. Whether or not you know, you're there having to mineralize the fetus and whether the bone mineral levels decrease, um, there are theories that it's to do with reduced blood supply around the area. It can be hormonal. No one is actually clear. But what happens is you get significant osteoporosis of the, um, the bone mineral of the fetus. And it's normally on the, very much usually on the left side, and I don't know why that is, but more often than not, it's on the left. So again, that's not explained. It doesn't show up well on the x-ray. Um, but in fact, this area here is very osteopenic compared to the other side. But when we did an MRI scan, and this was uh, su subsequently to the patient uh, uh, delivering, we saw this. It's usually a diagnosis of exclusion, okay? So if someone comes, you're limited because they're pregnant, uh, sometimes with all the investigations you're going to do, but you, you can do ultrasound and so on, exclude muscle tears, um, and it's a diagnosis of exclusion. But um, as I said, there have been quite a few cases. And once, once the patient delivers, it tends to, to, to sort itself out. So it's a, it's a symptomatic treatment for this. It's just analgesia um, and, and, and avoidance of weight bearing and things generally tend to settle down. Though it can take six to 12 months. Um, but just be aware of it if, if you have someone uh, sudden, and it, the pain is intense, and that, that's the thing. Okay, so exclude other cases, it causes X-ray, MRI, symptomatic analgesia, crutches, physio, usually resolves within six to 12 months. Have we got time for one more? The, no, no, they're all hot and they're tired. Okay, so I, I'll leave it there. Just, I'm just gonna get to my summary slide. So this is, it's, it's a busy slide, but just to, just to <laughs> what, the, 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 the basis of it is, someone's got pain in the hip, think about the lumbar spine, exclude that, okay? And then in, 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 a, in the younger patients, I've already outlined to you what things to look out for, what are the most common. All right, and uh, the, the red flag signs, things that mean that you must really send the patient up. Um, if the patient's unable to wait there, obviously if they've got an associated fever, a temperature, uh, if, if there's any marked um, loss of, of height of the legs or shortening, which could be a vascular necrosis. Um, obviously if they've got neurological symptoms, then those are the reasons that they need urgent referral. Otherwise, other than that, a course of physiotherapy can be tried. Okay.